My name is Beju Laiwola. I'm an artist and also uh, an art historian. And I am um, a descendant of the king that was exiled to Calabar by the British in 1897. Um, so I'm also uh, curating a show here, uh, the Isios Room, uh, which comprises the works of uh, artists who are activists who are involved in the story of um, expropriation of Benin objects uh, in 1897 and I also have some of my works here on display. It's so your room talks about the um, issue of resistance and uh, all the works that are in the Cologne Museum, the RJ Museum, have been brought out. Uh, it's not in the same style as we find for many ethnological displays in museums. Uh, they are brought out like how they kept in storage. Uh, there are about 96 uh, objects here and these were all looted. Uh, during the 1897 event in Benin City. So what we're looking at here is uh, the transparency of the museum to bring out the entire collection. Uh, many of them that have not been shown uh, in Cologne and outside of Cologne as well. Uh, of the 96 objects that are here in this display, only three have been in the permanent exhibition, meaning that 93 of them have been kept in storage. So what we're saying basically here is that these works do not belong in Cologne. They are looted artifacts, they are um, artifacts of Benin material that have the weight, carry the weight of trauma, carry the weight of ultraviolence, and they should be returned to the place of origin, which is Benin City in Nigeria. So I also say that um, I don't think you should worry so much about that. Uh, most of the ethnological museums in the West have been called museums of loot. Uh, what is uh, the bone of contention here is the issue of ownership. These works have been collected. Um, these were illegally acquired works. And I think this is a time for us to address those historical injustices and to say that, for example, that this work should be taken back to where they actually belong. If the, some of the works have to remain in these um, Western museums, then there has to be a change of narrative. There has to be a change of nomenclature from looted art to art that is loaned to the museums by Nigeria with the permission of the Oba of Benin, the king whose heirloom it is that was stolen. And I think that uh, this would be a new way of looking at, um, you know, a new way of looking at how objects are collected. Uh, before now, these objects, uh, there was so much emphasis on the uh, beauty of the works, the artistic um, rendition, the technicalities involved in producing these um, very exquisite bronze works or works in different media that were from Benin. Of course, there are quite a broad range of objects that were stolen from Benin. And only now that we begin to see the story come out, the story of the looting. And so the context of acquiring these works is so important. It has to come uh, ahead of even looking at the works themselves because you can't appreciate the work by just looking at the beauty of it without thinking about the, the weight of the killings that went on during the 1897 event. So I think that when you put this story beside the artistic, the forms that these works express, they begin to see that there has to be a new kind of narrative that should emerge from discussing these objects. I have seen these objects before, but I never had the opportunity of touching. I mean, this is my first time of actually handling a Benin object that was taken several years ago, over a hundred years ago, from the bedchamber and the palace of my great-great-grandfather about over I mean, you know so it, for me it was a very moving experience to touch the physical form and I you know was excited about that but I, I will wish that this is done more in Benin than in in Cologne for example you know for me this is about access really um, accessing the works and I have also mentioned the fact that a lot of the descendants of the producers of these art forms, the Guild of Bronze Casters, known as Igwemo, 
um, who are still practicing bronze casting in Benin have no access to these objects. So I, I, I'm really privileged to have access to them in different museums around around the world. But I will say that they have the um, you know the publications and postcards that show these images. You know publications that have been made by Western museums, and I always call these artificial filters for them to access their culture. So I think it's actually access. So as a professor of art. As an artist, I'm just having that contact for the first time. And you know that in any Western museum, the young curators, scholars have had access of, to these works for several, several decades. So I think it's, it's, it's really a shame that um, those who actually own the culture, who own these works, uh, are only just having access to it. So we have to rethink the whole idea of um, access in the museums and outside of it. Well, to start by saying that it is very important that the discussions are going on at different levels and that children are also involved in uh, thinking about ways in which restitution should be done. Uh, I think um, this is really that moment where people are sharing ideas and thinking about how to correct this injustice. We can't really erase the history of um, the expedition to Benin, but we can think about ways in which we can make it easy for those whose works who have been deprived of these objects for so many years. I also think that one of the examples I normally give is the work that was returned, the two objects that were returned by Adrian Walker to Benin in 2014. And that was a case of clear restitution where he inherited works from his father who had looted in Benin and he returned these works by himself to the place where his father had violated and committed a crime. And there was a lot of activity, there was a lot of um, jubilation in Benin when he did that. So I think that these are the kind of moments that we're beginning to see. And um, the return, it's not just mere return, but also to think about ways in which this kind of, this going to be new ways of thinking about collecting in the museums. It's a time to think about more ethical ways of collecting works in the museum. And there are works that were looted during the 1897 event, there were works that were looted. Uh, during the civil war in Nigeria, there were works that were looted after independence. So there are, there are different layers of loot. And so when you refer to the museums as museums and spaces, hegemonic spaces, where uh, the own that have the works that are, were looted from Africa, you know, you just are very right to say that, uh, in the sense that uh, there's so much that has come out of Africa, which um, are here, you know, and which ought to be in the various countries where they were looted from. So I would also say that um, the debate about restitution is uh, timely. It's, it's great that it's happening now. And for several, several decades, um, the members of the royal family in Benin have been requesting for these objects. When Europeans come to the museum to look at these objects, they have no personal connection to them. They have no idea. I could look at three or four of these objects and tell a story about them, stories that are been passed on from generation to generation. I could tell about stories of my mother who grew up in the palace of the King of Benin and talk about the coconut shell, for example, where she, she says that they were, the shells were carved by the sword bearers of the king. And I think there's just one in the collection here and how they used them as um, soap dishes when they were growing up. And so because they were carved by the sword bearers, they didn't have much value for them. And when anyone got broken, they got replaced, got replaced very easily. So you see a coconut shell and you're wondering, what is this? As a visitor to the museum in Cologne, but I can tell stories and narratives that, uh, that connect me very personally to these works, just like any other other person would. So I think that there's a disconnection here. It's not about having these works and kept in storage. How do you keep 93 works in storage? You don't need them if they're just kept away, you know, and tucked away in a corner. You have to think about um, these objects, what they mean to those who actually own them. And I think that uh, returning them to Benin or having them here within a, in a different context would serve well for the entire world. Well, we, we know that um, recently there were some returns, the one in Cambridge and the one in Aberdeen. And of course, this is something that is uh, being discussed by a lot of people at government level, at family levels, at university level uh, in, in Nigeria. Uh, when I had my first exhibition in 2010, that was the first exhibition uh, in Nigeria that focused on this story of 1897. And at that time, 
uh, it wasn't uh, really very popular to talk about restitution. But I thought that uh, it would be important to bring up this issue because I had been to the exhibition in um, Vienna, the Benin Kings and Rituals exhibition, which opened in 2007 in Vienna, traveled to Paris and Berlin, and closed in Chicago. And so I returned to Nigeria, and there was no discussion about this big exhibition in Nigeria. And I thought that I should address this by bringing to the fore this uh, whole story about the expropriation of Benin objects. And, and so I did that exhibition in 2010, and it came back. It was done um, in two university campuses, because I really wanted some kind of scholarly engagement with um, this topic at the University of Lagos and the, and the University of Ibadan, which is the premier university in Nigeria. So uh, coming from there, you know, people began to speak about it. The Nigerian press was awash with this story, and it came back to the front burner. Fast forward to 2021, we, the entire world is discussing issues about restitution and repatriation, and I think that um, this is the time for us to think about um, repair, reconciliation, empathy, and the ethics that surround the collection of works from different parts of the world. It is wonderful that the German government is thinking about returning over a thousand objects back to Benin from next year. Uh, the Germans were not in Benin. They acquired these objects when they came on the market. It was known that these were looted objects, so in a sense they are also culpable, you know, buying objects that were stolen. Um, so the several museums that are holding Benin objects, uh, there's also the plan to document and um, digitalize all of these um, objects and so that we know exactly where they are. Um, so the, a, lot of, a lot more information is going to come out from, you know, the history of these objects even before they got into the museum. And I think these are all very relevant to art historical studies and also for those of Benin, those in Benin who want to know more about how these works have traveled uh, over time. Um, my exhibition here in Cologne um, is, is, comes from a place of deep connection, not just for me as an artist, but also as one who has followed the story from 2005, when I took part in the Broken Memory Project, uh, which was uh, started by a French anthropologist, Bernard Mollet. So we were invited to do surveys in Benin City and to find out what the loss of these objects meant to the people of Benin. And so we did surveys within the district of the Bronze Casters. And after that, I got you know, involved in 2007, the Benin Kings and Rituals, and you know, my exhibition in 2010, another in 2014, which is a whole centenary project, the return in, um, which is a solo exhibition in South Africa uh, in 2018, and then this one in, in Cologne. Um, so for me, bringing together artists that I've followed over the years, uh, who have been involved in this struggle, who have been involved in this resistance, starting from the poem of Christy Akumabo, who um, writes a very beautiful poem about growing up in Benin City, and how the bronze works, the carvings, influenced you know, her writing. Even though she's a medical doctor based in the UK, she's writing from that, from that place of loving Benin and how Benin has impacted her, you know, her career as an artist who's also a scientist. And that is the opening of this exhibition. And then we'll go on to the beautiful um, video and audio of Monday Midnight, who is a Benin musician based in Belgium, who was doing this project, um, recording his video in front of Buckingham Palace in London. At the same time, I was also putting together my Benin1897.com exhibition in Nigeria. So we connect, we connected via the internet and we've remained friends uh, ever since. So his video is really very interesting because it's, I also featured his, uh, the, the lyrics of his video in my book, my catalog. And he, he's also looking at contemporary um, expressions of violence and saying that all of these um, expressions of violence do not equate to the ultra virus violence that occurred in Benin in 1997. So we also have the works of the cartoons of um, Jimo Ganiyu, who is one of my students. He was inspired to make these cartoons um, 
when I had my show in 2010, and I think there is a series of about three of them, but only one is in this exhibition where it talks about how African objects are kept in Europe and America, but uh, illegal you know, immigrants are told to leave. You know. And so it looks at how Africans are treated in every part of the world, how um, some of these obnoxious theories about Africans not being able to take care of their tangible heritage and things like that. So that cartoon actually, you know, encapsulates all of this uh, thinking and you know, sensibilities expressed by Europeans. I also have a work which I did in South Africa under the auspices of the residency of, for artists and writers in um, Grahamstown at the Rhodes University, where I did a four-piece panel, which was also here on display, which focused on the story of expropriation across, across Africa. So not just the Benin objects, but to look at it in the context of all the areas that have been plundered, like the Ashanti region, where a lot of gold treasures were removed, and then Ethiopia as well, the Battle of Magdala, where uh, Coptic crosses, manuscripts, valuable religious materials were also removed, alongside the story of Sarah Batman, um, how you know, the human, human remains that were repatriated to South Africa. So when you're talking about, whether you're talking about um, human remains or artifacts, it was the same kind of sensibility of looting and expropriation that happened all over Africa. I think the, this museum is um, exemplary in the way in which it has handled this issue of building bronzes. And it's shown that it's really willing to hand over those bronzes, even though they're very valuable. I think it places the building story above the object itself and says that um, it, is, it makes much more sense. It makes much more sense to hand these objects back. I think they also try to detach themselves from that colonial history and by being transparent, you know, I think it's also commendable that this is being done and I think that this is a model for many other museums across Europe and America. We also want to separate the attempt here from many other museums that are just caught in the euphoria of the moment. All of a sudden, every museum around the world wants to hand over Benin objects. But I think that we must separate the, this very genuine effort from those that emanate from, you know, the kind of fad that is on at the moment. And that is why I'm also involved in this project. Um, I have been to several other museums, but I've never been this involved in um, speaking about the Benin story like I have in this exhibition. Um, as an artist who has worked on this theme for several, over two decades, I will say again that for me it's very satisfying. For a lot of other artists who have been doing this um, in the realm of fiction, playwrights and film producers, um, they had always talked about this in the realm of fiction, writing about, writing historical plays and also doing films where one of the characters goes in to take a building object from the museum. But seeing it now in reality, it's really very satisfying. So it has left the realm of fiction to the realm of reality. And I think that um, it's really a very welcome idea. For me, it's also a learning um, point for a lot of people who do not know a lot about the kind of injustices that happen on the African continent. It is time for Germany to open up to learning about other cultures as well, and learning about their complicity in the colonial, colonial period in different parts of Africa. Um, one of the stands here, one of the It's Yours rooms, looks at the genocide that occurred in Namibia amongst the Herero and Lama people. So when you look at the pillage of artifacts and the way and manner human remains were handled, it's just the same kind of sensibility. And so I think this is a new way of thinking about people's emotions, thinking about empathy, and thinking about 
what the other side also feels and not go ahead with your own vision about who they are. And I think there should be mutual respect for one another. I think this exhibition does that in many ways. So people are coming, they're asking questions about, oh, when did this happen? What transpired? They're just beginning to see here of the atrocities that were committed during the colonial period. So I think it's a starting point to have more and more discussions about other cultures and seeing the relevance in, as a global history rather than having um, you know, European history and then the others. Resistance for me has several meanings. It has several layers of meanings. Yeah, for example, uh, there was resistance in Benin when the king had said to the British party that he was very busy um, doing a secret festival and he was not willing to receive visitors. They searched ahead, they forged ahead, and they disregarded all the warnings that had come to them because they had a mission. They actually were going on a mission to... Uh, in fact, that was the first expedition, if you ask me, just that they were ambushed. So um, the Benin defenders were... They actually resisted the British. They re resisted British imperialism, and so they took charge of their own community, their own nation, as it were, and didn't want that kind of colonial or British incursion. So that's resistance. And then uh, in terms of um, uh, artists and the various interventions, we've had artists who have also put up resistance. Um, for me, in my 2014 project, the Who's Centenary project, which you did in Benin City, we thought we should go back to the atelier and the living quarters of the casters and do our iteration there. So I invited about 10 other artists to come along with me and to vent this concept of the 2014 centenary year of the amalgamation of um, the Southern and Northern Protectorate of Nigeria. So because the Nigerian state celebrated this event, as artists we thought that we should look at some other part of the history that we could celebrate, because we didn't think that was worth celebrating. And we discovered that 2014 was a centenary commemoration of the death of Oba Ovarame, who was exiled to Calabar. So he stood against British imperialism and we thought to celebrate his life, the hundredth year of his passing. And so one of the artists, um, Jalili Atiku, who's a very well-renowned performance artist from Nigeria, um, raised an altar for the king and he had a banner which he titled this performance Holy Ovarame Cathedral. So in a way, he was also making commentary on Christianity. And because we are told as Africans that our religion was fetish, it was pagan, that our dances were vulgar, and when we spoke our languages, we, they told us it was vernacular. So everything about us, our culture was denigrated, it was put down. And for us, it's a recovery process. Now we're beginning to tell younger people that the younger generation that there's so much value, there's so much richness in our culture. Uh, we shouldn't put down our culture like it was put down during the colonial period. It's, it was a whole period of erasure of self. Uh, when you're diminished from the outside, then you have really very little self-worth. So if you look at the bronze works, you see that this relic of, of the great civilization that held the Benin city. You can't say these are done by savages, or barbaric people. These were works that were or showed a very high, highly developed civilization. This is really very important that this is happening at this time. There's so much that is going on now. We're learning a lot about our history. The outside world is learning a lot about our history. We've always had a history, not a history of when the British or the Europeans discovered us, but we had this long tradition of, and this long chronology of objects, of material culture. We've had this long history of kings, royalties, the Benin kingdom, the Benin royal household is still in place. These objects can connect directly with rituals and activities that go on in the court. Um, it's not an extinct culture. It's still very much in place. The chronology of kings is still in place. People can trace their ancestry. It's not something that is tucked away 
um, and lost in history. It's something that is very much part of and parcel of Nigerian culture today. Okay, well, uh, I think I look at the one object which I like very much. There are quite a number of them here in this collection, about four or five um, gongs. Uh, the brass gongs, which were kept on the altars of the king. And usually those gongs, are, you sound them, you hit them, or you ring them, because they have a, like a rattle um, when it's time for worship. Because the belief is that once you ring them, then you're actually calling the ancestors, you're calling the spirits to commune. That is ancestral worship. And so, um, it's so significant. Sometimes you have the gong, which is beaten, like a sistrum. It's beaten during the annual Igwe festival. And they also have a very elaborate one here, uh, made of brass. It has a lot of beautiful iconography on the entire body of it. But it doesn't have a rattle inside, so you use a metal um, to hit the gong. So the whole idea is that the hollow of the gong uh, sounds out. So. So when you hit the gong, it's a sound that sends signals. And so there are many of them here, different beautiful, beautiful textures on them. Uh, because the Benin Arts corpus was meant to be beautiful as well as functional. You know, they had religious significance. They were not just objects to admire and keep on the shelf. They had a function that they, they performed. So you also had the gong as part of the regalia of the king. And sometimes the warriors also wore the gong around their chest. You know, they tied it around the chest and they called it Ukubo Lila. And so when you walk majestically to war, the gong rings, sounds, and also tells the other warriors that you are marching gallantly to win. It had a lot of meaning within the culture. One of the questions I asked my mom about the gong, she told the story once how when they were much younger, they would walk in the harem. You know, the harem was where the wives of the kings stayed. And there were several altars. So they would go into the altar area, where they, because each king raised an altar for the past king in honor of his father. So there were several of these altars. These were um, beds of history. You know, so you could actually say, oh, this, is, this altar was raised for this particular king. Sometimes the symbols that are associated with particular kings, you know, will tell you that this altar was for this king. So that is why it was very easy for the British soldiers to cut as many works as possible, because they went into this archive of history where these altars were kept. So as young children, they would go in and sometimes play with the bells. And it was only when they rang the bell that their father the Israel Majesty of Akenzwa II would come out and say, no, 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 leave there, you can't be ringing the bell. Because he knew the significance of that. But they didn't know as children that these were not toys. They were, you know, some device to call for communion, for worship. And there are about four of them here, actually five of them in this collection, four gongs and one sistrum. And so, they tell a story. They tell a story that's still relevant today within the culture that produced them. This is a time where we can have new negotiations and new thinking about the history of others, you know, and to think about it on the basis of equality. Um, so. This is a time that um, we begin to look at things with the eye of, um, of equality, with, of, of um, justice, um, not what transpired during the colonial period where there was a lot of, a lot of atrocities uh, committed by you know, the colonialists. So um, we might think about the African continent in a different way. It, has, it was a heavily pillaged continent. A lot of the resources were removed and some of the difficulties that the African continent is experiencing today arises from the colonial period. So um, it's a way of thinking about relational ethics for also the museums as well, and for just interpersonal relationships. I think this is so important.
Cologne is a very beautiful city. It's, um, it's cold at the moment, but the people are very warm. I think that um, the activists here have done quite a bit. They've done a lot of work in trying to sensitize people about uh, some of these issues I will discuss here today. Um, we can all feel trauma, we can all feel pain. And I think that as human beings, we must think about the other person that we are relating with um, in ways that do not damage the other person that we interact with. In our daily lives, we must think about you know, how best to bring out the best in us. Some of these terrible devices of racism you know, have a long impact. They have a long uh, impact in, in creating a lot of rifts that we do not need in this world. Uh, in the last um, year or so, we've seen what racism has done to the entire world, the killing of uh, George Floyd and all the uprising that has gone on. People are tired of this wickedness, you know, that human beings express to one another. And if you talk about this pillage that had gone on, it's some form of wickedness. We must think about how to be kind to one another, how we can think about the other person. Whether the person is from Germany or from outside of Germany, we're all human beings, we all belong to the human race. Um, so we, we must be kind to one another and think about how to make the world much better.